Um, in case you don't know, I'm Peter Spencer Phillips. I'm trying to my mind around my new role. I'm Academic Director, International Research for the Faculty of Health and Applied Sciences. Phew. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been practicing that all, all week in, in Vietnam. Um, anyway, on to the main business of today. Um, it is a very great pleasure to welcome Dr. Cameron Nalong, um, who is the Advocacy Director at the Public Library of Science, or PLOS as we know it. And I'm going to embarrass him a little bit by giving a bit of background. I think it does set the context very nicely. Um, so Cameron graduated with a BSc, I'm glad to say, in biochemistry in <laughs> Western Australia. I'm a, a scientist, you've probably gathered. And then a PhD in chemistry, Australian National University. Uh, he moved on at the <laughs> University of Bath to a post as a Wellcome Trust International <laughs> Fellow and then a lectureship in chemical biology at the University of Southampton. At the same time, holding down two roles as part of that period, um, as senior scientist uh, with the Science and Technology Facilities Council. And that was through to the end of 2012, I think. Um, since then, he has been in this role in uh, PLOS. And what he says about himself in this role is... And I lead the advocacy program at PLOS, supporting open access developments and the wider transformation of research communication. And here's the embarrassing bits. I'm not going to read what someone else has said about him. Uh, so this is someone called Anthony Williams, who's the uh, vice president of strategic development, head of the Chemical Informatics Group of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Cameron is a calm, cool, and collected evangelist with an incredible skill for communicating the need for change and innovation in the domain of open science. Welcome, the floor's yours. Thank you, so now I have to deliver on that and, and be both clear and persuasive. Um, one thing I, I, I won't do um, is, I'm, my job is, is advocacy director, and it's kind of difficult to explain what that is. Um, but one of the things I, I used to say is, it's not marketing. Um, so I'm not here to sell you on PLOS or publishing with PLOS. So I'm happy to answer questions um, afterwards. Um, what I want to do is talk more broadly about open access and, and, and where it's moving and, and hopefully why it's moving. So what I'm proposing to do is I've got a presentation which is quite abstract. Um, and it's about, for me, the principles of why we're moving in this direction. And then I'll get down into, the, into a sort of a question and answer session where I'll, I'll pose questions to you um, as a way of helping us to talk about these issues and what's, what's really relevant for you um, on the ground here at, here at UWE. Before I do that, can I just get a sense of, um, so who amongst you would describe yourself as a researcher? Okay, and of, of all of you, who of you would describe your background as sciences? <laughs> who would describe your background as social sciences? Yourself, you're self-labeling here. Okay, and who would describe themselves as humanities? Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a really nice spread. Um, it's, kind of, it's always interesting to see how people self-label as well. Um, and then the other, the other question, kind of the, the key question in some of these discussions, um, who of you feels that you have a permanent job? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, that's not, that was probably not, not, a, not a great way to ask the question. Who, who would describe themselves as an early career researcher? Okay, great. That, that's so we've got to actually got that's that's an amazing spread. So, depending on what's happened in the news at these things, I tend to either get mostly librarians, mostly scientists, or mostly irate humanists. <laughs> um, so, so um, uh, that's great to have such a, such an even spread um, across things. Um, and I, hopefully, I'll address all of those kinds of issues as we go as we go through. Um, before I start, and as far as I'm concerned, for the purposes of the recording, this, is, this will do as a release, um, I like to emphasise 
because I'm going to talk about reuse, I'm going to talk about access and accessibility. Um, I don't just talk about this as far as I'm concerned. You are free to take any of the elements of this and, and use them um, as it's useful to you. Um, if you go and take these ideas and images and thoughts and send them to other places, that just means I'm doing my job better in communicating what I do. So I want to start with a focus on on 2013, this year, because this year I think is, is absolutely pivotal um, in terms of the shift, particularly in the UK, um, around a whole series of things and, and open access, public access, whatever words we use to describe that is one, one element of that. Obviously in the UK, the REF has focused people's minds, um, sometimes in productive ways, sometimes in not entirely productive ways. Um, on questions of what we mean by research quality and research impact. Um, but it's been substantial change globally. And actually, we have to go back to 2012, or in fact, actually, strictly speaking, the beginning of 2011, to really understand the global context for that. And actually, it's, it's, it's interesting, but the real source of momentum for change over the past uh, two years has largely been this piece of legislation um, which was put into the US Congress as an attempt to roll back, legally roll back, the NIH public access policy. And for those of you who are not aware of the NIH public access policy, all of those papers published resulting from NIH funded work, which amounts to about 30 billion a year, which is, so it's not, not, not a trivial amount of research, have to go into PubMed Central and be available to read, at least, uh, within 12 months of the date of publication. Um, this is an incredibly popular policy. Um, it's actually now even popular amongst researchers, believe it or not. Um, but it's very popular amongst patient groups, primary care workers, um, and medical workers in general. And it's pretty safe to say that this piece of legislation, sponsored largely by a small group of traditional publishers, um, actually created a backlash which has changed the public awareness of this issue um, a very great deal. And that led to things like ultimately Elsevier who had been a supporter of this bill backed out. Um, some of you may be aware that there was a, there still is, um, a, an ongoing boycott of Elsevier by, by around about 15,000 academics now. Um, and some of you may have heard events of last week which have um, sort of added fuel to the fire there as well. But this has be become a public political issue. And while I think it's fairly safe to say in the UK that, that David Willits very much already had this on his agenda, this public awareness of the issue was part of what gave him the political cover to take as radical uh, a, a road as he, as he has done. That in the end actually led, in the US case at least, to uh, a um, petition to the White House to, d to adopt a larger public access policy, to, to expand the NIH public access policy to all of the federally funded research in the US. And this would amount to about 150 to 200 billion dollars a year. Um, so this is a big deal. Um, and that in the end led to the White House executive order. Now I'm focusing quite a lot on the US side here because the US drives a lot of what happens in practice in scholarly publishing. But this White House executive order essentially, this is the largest public access policy for research that has ever existed. Um, and it's substantial and it's progressive in ways that, that the older policies weren't. There is also a, a bill, in fact there's now two bills before US Congress. Um, this is one called the Fair Access to Science, Technology and Research Act, um, which has bipartisan and bicameral support um, in the US Congress. Um, and you yeah, believe me, if I'm getting anything that's actually got bipartisan support in the US Congress at the moment is pretty tough. In the UK, obviously we had, we had a lot of things occurring over the course of this year. We've had the implementation of the RCUK policy. We've had a couple of parliamentary inquiries. Uh, we've had HEFKI proposed, and this consultation's now just closed, um, an open access policy. Um, 
that is different in some ways to, to what the RCUK policy. We can come back to those differences. But the momentum is, is substantial. In the European Union, Horizon 2020, just recently the budget was finally voted through. So this is 70 billion euros over seven years. And the, the wording in the legislation says, open access will be a requirement of receiving money from this program. That includes European Research Council as well as the European Union program. So again, 70 billion euros in Europe, substantial funding in the UK, about $150 billion worth of research in the US. Argentina has just voted in a national open access requirement. Peru did one earlier in the year. The Australian research agencies have just created another set of policies. The policy movement is substantial, really across Europe, across North America, and other parts of the world. And so I want to argue that this we are reaching a tipping point. And the theme of this talk, the thing that I want to get across to you is there is no longer time to sit around thinking about whether you want to do this. This is happening and the choice is to have this happen with you or happen to you. So I said I wouldn't give you any PLOS propaganda. This is the one slide that works from, from PLOS data. Um, and this is just one way of showing that open access publishing is growing massively. This is the growth of PLOS One as a journal publishing Wellcome Trust funded outputs. I could show you the same graph for the NIH, for the MRC, for the University of Oxford, for the University of Cambridge, Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Stanford, Harvard, UC system. The growth of open access publishing is also massive alongside these policies that are focusing on open access archiving. So, and there's a, an article from Laxo and Bjork, which I recommend as a source of sort of no, no longer quite up-to-date data because they only go up to 2011. But my argument is that if we look, when we look back at 2013, we look at the combination of open access publishing plus open access archiving in disciplinary repositories and institutional repositories, this will be the year that within a reasonable amount of time, 50% of all published research articles, I'm going to be careful about what I say here, um, were made publicly accessible to read, at least. And that's a, a substantial tipping point. Some of you may have seen the Science Metrics report published a little while ago that claimed we'd already hit that 50% point. I it's safe to say that I don't think anyone really accepts those numbers. There are substantial concerns about the methodology. But the principle is the same. This growth is hitting the point where Actually, it's getting to the case where most of the time you can read most of the stuff. And that's a real change. So it's no longer really a question of if we're going to have access to published outputs. It's a question of how we manage to do that implementation. And obviously, there is substantial disagreement around the details of how this, how this will be implemented in practice. Also questions of how fast the transition can or should be, and whether it should be going at different rates in different domains and different disciplines. Um, again, substantial disagreement over that um, for perfectly good reasons. But I also want to focus on the question of why. Because as we move into this phase of implementing open access, implementing public access, and I'll start to make a distinction between those two things, we need to understand why we're trying to do this because implementation details involve compromises and challenges and difficulties. And if we don't have a sense of what we're trying to achieve by doing this, then we'll probably make some of the wrong decisions. And those will be hard to reverse further down the track. Um, so, so this is one of the questions I want to pose. And I want to work through some of the arguments for open access. Um, so one of those arguments is that the government pays for research. Substantially, the government pays for research. But of course, it's not actually the government um, that's paying, it's, it's the taxpayer. Um, and it's worth knowing that we, at least most of us, I suspect all of us, at some level at least, are taxpayers. So we have a stake on both sides of this equation. And the argument is very simple. The people who pay for the research to be done have a reasonable right to have access to the outputs of that research. It's, it's an ethical argument. Um, a political argument, and it's a very powerful um, political argument and a very good argument. It has been a very important part of, of the argument. 
Um, but it's also an argument of the sort that goes, wouldn't it be great if everyone was just nice to each other? It's a bit hippie when we're talking about the realities of constrained budgets, of research assessment requirements, of maintaining our presence on the world stage and delivering on government requirements and their research agenda. I'm not saying it's a bad argument, it's an argument I deploy regularly, but it's not enough in and of itself. These ty types of arguments on their own do not tend to win the day. So I want to make another argument. That argument is fundamentally a business case. And I know these are not popular kinds of arguments. And I don't always feel comfortable <coughs> making them myself. But the point I would make is that if we don't collectively as a community master the deployment of these kinds of arguments, then flat cash is going to turn into declining cash, is going to turn into reducing budgets over time. We have to make a case in terms that politicians and government and industry and the wider public understand. <coughs> and that is to some extent a business case. So we need to talk about the quality of service we offer to the people paying for the research. Are we delivering everything we could be delivering in terms of the amount of money we're receiving? We need to talk about value for money. Are we doing things as cost effectively as we could? And obviously, we also need to talk about sustainability because it's no, no good doing things brilliantly and cheaply for one year and then having the whole system collapse on itself. So these, these are kind of the core issues. And then there's a final one. And again, you know, I know this is not necessarily a popular word, um, but it's a word that we can either take and control a narrative around or we can have imposed upon us. So engaging with it, I would argue, is, is incredibly important. So if we're talking about a business case, of course, we always have to ask who is the customer. And we can go through a similar kind of argument, really. In a large part, the customer is the government, the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills that are funding a lot of this research, the other government departments that fund research efforts in general. Of course, again, the argument flows through that we're not really talking about the government per se, but the taxpayer in general. And then again, of course, we have a stake on both sides of this argument. Um, and I would argue the product is research outcomes. And I use the word outcomes advisedly, not outputs. Neither the minister, nor the Department of Business and Innovation Skills, nor your neighbours paying their taxes give a hoot about the publication of research papers or monographs or even patents. They want to know about how this is changing their world, the world, making the nation more wealthy, making the, the global environment better. Also things like letting us understand ourselves better, or building a stronger culture, um, building a stronger politics. Um, those things are not out of the equation. We don't need to talk about just monetary value by any means. But I think we need to focus on actually delivering the outcomes that we talk about when we talk about the value of our research um, and actually delivering on those as part of the product offering. Um, and my argument is fundamentally we can do better than we do at the moment. And that's all. If we can do better, then we should. That's, that's the crux of the argument. I want to give some examples about research in general. I'll move towards, towards research outputs later. But, but I want to, want to start on, on, on thinking about research in general. So, so here's an example of a change in the ability to do research. So Tim Gowers, any mathematicians in the room? Good, so my bad explanation of this project will get away with it, good. Um, <laughs> Tim Gowers is a Fields Medalist, which is a Nobel Prize for Mathematics, in effect. Um, he also happens to be a blogger, and he's interested in collaboration conceptually. And being of an experimental mindset, he posed a problem, uh, a thought experiment, said, OK, so if I pose a problem, can I get a group of people using the internet to work together collaboratively to solve this problem. Would that be interesting? Would it go faster? Would it help us, help us do things? Um, and you've got to bear in mind that mathematics is very much a discipline where people traditionally sit themselves in an office with a pencil and paper. So in that way, it's not that different from a lot of the humanities. So he poses a particular problem, um, and he poses the problem of, um, of proving this particular unproven um, thesis 
except actually he cavils on that. He's very clever about how he sets the experiment up. So he says, it's not, we're not going to try and solve this problem. We're not going to try and create the proof. I've provided an outline of a proof that I think could work, and I'm going to ask you to help me show whether that could work or not. And it's worth bearing in mind that he said that would probably take him between 9 and 18 months to determine whether the proof was worth pursuing. This is one of the world's leading mathematicians. The context I want to, I want to put that in. And he thinks the chances of success are less than 100%. Um, but that um, even if it fails, it's an interesting experiment. He set this up to, to ask the question. So six weeks later, he writes this other blog post which, in which he says he reckons the problem is solved. Um, actually, in a different way to the way he proposed, they've actually come up with a proof amongst 140 people interacting in the comments of a blog in the process of six weeks. So again, he said it would take him 9 to 18 months to figure out whether his proposed proof would work or not. This group of people, about 140, some of them are world leading mathematicians, some of them are school teachers, engaged with the problem collectively within a given framework using the internet as a tool um, and solved the whole problem in six weeks. In fact, they solved a more general case. Um, of the proof as it happens. And Tim goes on to say this feels as to normal researchers driving is to pushing a car. You're suddenly realising you've got a set of keys and you can stick them in the engine and do something and this takes you places you couldn't go before. So the argument I want to make is this is qualitatively different. This is not the internet letting us do things better or faster. It is let the internet letting us do things different. And I'll keep coming to this point. If we can get this kind of acceleration in some areas of research, then surely we should be identifying the places where it can happen and making it happen. Another example, um, which probably many of you are aware of from the perspective of citizen science stories. I want to tell this story in a slightly different way, though. So Galaxy Zoo was set up to solve a problem. The problem was one of, we've got lots of data on galaxies, but to actually use that data to look at um, the evolution of galaxies and we need to classify them into different shapes and, and, and a person can do that very effectively just by looking at a picture of the galaxy and there are the Sloan Digital Sky Survey has a million pictures of galaxies so there's no shortage of data the data is open and available but it requires someone to look at it um, and at the time this was done computer algorithms were not capable of doing this with any degree of quality whatsoever. So an experienced researcher could maybe do a hundred of these in a day or a week depending on you know, obviously how many meetings they also have to be in. Um, this is the number of classifications you need to actually at that time justify the statistics that would allow you to publish a paper on this. And there's a bit of a mismatch here. We have, we have something of a problem. That, but that's fine. We have, we have automated systems um, in research. We call them graduate students. Okay. Um, and this is a particular graduate student who, over the course of his PhD, did 50,000 classifications. And having done them, handed his thesis and said, I am never going to do another one of them again. <laughs> um, this is kind of the limits of human endurance, essentially. And this is the number of data sets available. And part of the problem in this field was, in fact, that people were doing relatively small portions of this data set and actually getting different answers because the statistics were not strong enough. So what they did, and I want to tell this, they, they, what they did was they put that problem out to anyone to contribute. They structured the problem in a way that anyone could contribute through a web browser. They turned it into a game. And over the course of a couple of months, 300,000 people classified those million galaxies 10 times over, changing the statistical quality of the system in a way that allowed you to ask different questions. They used the network infrastructure to reach a set of resources, happened to be people, who could contribute back into a central data store. And this was made easy by the fact that browsers can display images and can record clicks. And they can do that at a massive scale. 
So again, the point I want to make is that it's qualitatively different. Here's a different kind of example. Um, this is uh, Mahatma Gandhi's Indian Home Rule. This is the, the, the basic text of the Indian Home Rule movement. Again, is there anyone who's actually knows this as an academic subject in the room before I embarrass myself? Excellent. Um, so the thing I want to draw your attention to is the thing at the bottom. It says no rights reserved. So he's making a political point here. And there's actually there's some really interesting work being, being done on Gandhi's interaction with copyright law over the course of his life. And it's, it, there's a more complicated story behind this. Um, but this, this is at the beginning of what he was doing. This is both a political statement and a genius piece of propaganda and network manipulation. Because by publishing this and making it clear that anyone else could publish it and translate it, he got it translated through the thousand or so newspapers that were spreading across India at the time in the thousands of local dialects. And that's what built the movement that ultimately led to Indian in independence. Okay, that's a sweeping, sweeping generalization, but, but there's an important point here that this isn't restricted to data, it's not restricted to images and science. The same arguments can apply in, in the social sciences and indeed in politics. And I'm going to go back another couple of hundred years. Um, this is something I, actually that I own. Um, it's the London Walsh edition of Corelli's Violin Sonatas. Um, and this is interesting because this is, done, this is published a couple of years before the Statute of Anne. So this is before copyright. And Walsh, without permission, buys a copy of Corelli's Rome edition reprints it in London and sells thousands of these, which is why I can afford to have one. A lot of the reason why Corelli is a name that we recognise today, and Torelli is not, and all the other Italian violin virtuosi of the same period doing more or less the same thing, writing more or less the same music, is that this guy spread Corelli's work right across Europe in a way that he couldn't have done himself. It's also not necessarily re 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 reduced to things that are, that are just data. Um, sometimes people feel that these things work fine when you transmit them across the web, but what about materials? What about things that require lab work? And this is just an example of a, of a global project um, that's looking at trying to develop and optimise a set of anti-malarial lead compounds, potential lead compounds. And they're doing this in a global collaboration. They share the data about the experiments, they, the, and then they post the compound they've made to someone who's going to do the, the biological testing. And they've built a network of this where people who have some synthetic skill which isn't available in the rest of the group can say, oh, I can make that. And they do, and they send it off. Someone else tests it. The data is all shared. And they're making progress to the extent that, for those of you who have some experience in, um, in drug development, that thing that I've highlighted down there is a, is a fluorine derivative of the compound, which has an IC, uh, actually I can't remember if it's an IC50 or, or what exactly it is, but sub-nanomolar efficacy. That means this is a viable lead compound. Now, it turns out that actually the metabolic characteristics of this are not, aren't suited. But the point is that they're making progress on an area that's very difficult to get funding for by combining the resources of a large number of labs and spreading the load and distributing it. Here's an example of something not going so well. This is actually a comment on my blog. And again, I, I really do want to emphasize the arguments I'm making. I don't see a difference between sciences, social sciences and humanities. So this is a comment by someone who wanted to remain anonymous, um, but who I believe is actually a consultant to um, ministerial level people in Whitehall. And his point is, for those of us who complain about the fact that politics is always driven by economics, that the economics is the only thing he can get at, and so it's the only thing that he's prepared to include in his policy briefs, because the sociology and the history and the anthropology isn't accessible. And so it's not going into the policy briefs, A, because the people preparing them can't read them, and B, because some of them at least are 
principled enough to not put in things that other people won't be able to check up for themselves. And it's worth noting, just if we get onto licensing towards the end, that this guy would need permission to do something commercial because he's a freelance consultant. To take your work and put it in front of the minister, if he's being paid, that's a commercial activity. So let's drill down a little bit here into what the patterns are. How does this, how does this work in practice? One of the things that's really important is to understand the scale of what's going on. All of these different um, projects exploit scale and the scale of the web in particular. Galaxy Zoo is an obvious case of that. Using 300,000, half a million people to decide what the shape of a galaxy is, is, is clearly using scale at a very large level. But equally, changing mathematics from being one person to being 100 is also changing the scale, taking advantage of the ability to reach people. Taking advantage of the ability to reach another 10 chemists <coughs> can make a difference. So a lot of this is about realising that things at scale are different in the way they behave. And I'll keep coming back to this point. Another key point is connectivity. So in the case of the Polymath project, Tim Gowers, this actually exploited a pre-existing network of people, mathematicians who were blogging, who knew each other and were following each other. There was already a strong connectivity between them. In the Galaxy Zoo case, it's the connectivity of the web itself, of the fact that browsers can take images and receive clicks and pass them back to a database. That connectivity is there and ready to exploit. In Gandhi's case, it's the connectivity provided by the, by the rising spread of the printing press and the railway system. So this is not just digital systems that show these kinds of characteristics. And then the other thing is efficiency of transfer, making it easy to transfer things. And again, the Galaxy Zoo case is a good example of this. The whole system was set up to make it really easy to interact with. The data was already available, so there's no need to negotiate there. The browser system, if you look at it, it's set up to be really easy to interact with. You have 30 seconds of training and then you're off and going. And you're already contributing to a scientific project. But I'll come back to that transfer thing. The point I make is that things change with these network infrastructures. We have a network communications infrastructure which is unprecedented. And that changes our ability to communicate and interact. So you'll hear technology evangelists talk about things at web scale all the time. And that's kind of shorthand for what I'm saying here. In the academic community, we've pretty much systematically failed to exploit that. Again, let me try and flesh that out in a kind of visual way for you. So when we think about building networks, and making networks. We often think about it in this kind of way in, in academia and indeed in industrial policy as well. So if the blue circles here are people who have an idea or have published a paper or whatever it might be, and the yellow dot is someone who could actually use that as a potential point of impact that is otherwise not connected in this network. Now, our natural response is to say, okay, so what we need to do is create opportunities for these existing networks to come together. We create coffee mornings. We bring people together and offer them free food. We have the Technology Strategy Board to convene sand pits. That's the kind of thinking that makes perfect sense. None of, none of this is a dumb thing to do. It makes perfect sense. It's a very sensible way of, of tackling this problem, particularly when you know what the networks look like or think you know what the network, no, yeah, networks look like. But it's missing a fundamental characteristic of the web which is that there are 3 billion people on it and 400 million people on Twitter and 1 billion people on Facebook. It doesn't actually matter that only one in a thousand people out there has any interest or knowledge of your research area. When we're talking at scale, those people exist. The only question is whether you're connecting with them. And so despite the fact these people, those connections may be weaker than the stronger networks in existing, connections in existing academic networks, at scale, it's more likely for information to be transferred through those nodes, through those people, through those systems, than it is for it to be transferred through academic systems. 
And so you end up with a potential for impact, whatever way you want to call it, delivery of our products, in all sorts of new places and all sorts of new connections that can deliver the connections within the, that can deliver further impact within the academic community. In principle, this is possible. And each time we deny access to someone, each time we make it difficult for them to take something and use it, each time they can't discover it because it's hidden somewhere on the dark web and Google doesn't know about it, each time we don't allow someone to do a translation, we potentially cut these connections. And that, for me, is the underlying point behind open access. Because in a world where we as a community are trying to optimise impact, contentious though that term is, I'll use it as a shorthand, these are our value proposition, those yellow dots. And so by denying access, we reduce the potential for that. So the question fundamentally is how do we make these networks, how do we build these networks effectively? Um, and I would argue as service providers, I'm going back to the business case argument here, as service providers, how do we deliver them? Um, and how do we deliver scale at a global level? Because I'm trying to make the point that we have to do this at a global level to, to get the most benefits. How do we create connectivity? Um, how do we reduce friction? How do we make it really easy to transfer things through? So it's easy for that information, that concept, that knowledge, that data, that idea, that picture, that text, to flow through multiple places to find the place where it can ultimately make a difference. And so I would argue there are three things, three core things, and they're the three steps towards an open access environment. Um, and we're making progress towards each of them some faster than others. So the first of those is the obvious one. You need access. You need to be able to actually touch this thing, <coughs> to read it, to see it, to know that it's there. That's a fundamental. Um, and that's what the US policies and the European policies will deliver, um, and the UK policies deliver, through allowing these different potential routes to make things readable by providing public access. So this is necessary to get the kind of gains that I'm talking about. Um, but it's not sufficient. And it's not sufficient because if you can only look and not touch and not play with, then we have a problem. That gets me to the second characteristic of these systems, um, which is that we need to provide the legal rights and the interoperability that maximises the ability of people to reuse to manipulate, to repurpose, to create things and change things, to put them into a form which someone else can find useful. And this is where we start getting into that contentious space because people are uncomfortable in many ways with their work being taken and transformed and reused and translated and all those kinds of things. But the point I want to make is if that yellow dot up in the top left corner is the minister of a West African country and she only speaks French, that it needs to get to her policy advisors in French in a form they understand. It has to go through multiple steps along the way. And every time you put a block to one of those steps legally, then you're putting in extra friction. It, does, it, it could still happen, but you're making it harder. And you're making it harder particularly for the unexpected connections to be made. And that's really kind of the critical point. I, do, I want to give an example of this. Sorry, this is the other piece of PLOS propaganda, but it's not really propaganda. It's just an example. This is a paper published on, as it happens, a West African um, species of monkey um, published in PLOS One, 12th of September 2012. That date's, that date's relevant. This is the Wikipedia article about nine hours after the article goes live. It is largely populated by things taken directly from the PLOS One article. It's done by someone who has no connection whatsoever with the authors, but it's done by an experienced Wikipedia editor who knows that PLOS One is a source of content that they are allowed to take and put into Wikipedia. The Wikipedia article now has had about 150,000 page views, which is good, that puts it in a pretty high number. Sorry, the PLOS One page has had about 150,000 page views, which is good, you know, 100,000 is a, is a paper that's doing really, really well. 
puts it in, puts, easily puts it in the top 5% of all, of all PLOS papers. Wikipedia articles seen 2 million. Where do people go to find information? Where do you go to find information? Be honest with yourself. You start with Google, <laughs> and then the top hit is always Wikipedia. And unless you see something a couple down, which you know is what you need because you have a little bit more expertise, every time you're in a position of not knowing where to start, that Wikipedia link is going to be the top point. And for factual searches, it's basically the place where everybody goes. If your research is not being flowing into Wikipedia, you're missing massive opportunities for engagement. And in this case, they know they're allowed to do it because of the licensing we apply to PLOS papers. So the third thing, so these are two things you're probably at least familiar with the arguments around, you've heard, heard, heard pieces of, but there's a third, third problem, um, which is it's all very well to be able to see that it's there and to be able to know that you're allowed to do something with it. But if you're technically not able to do anything with it, if you've given me a PDF with a CC BY license, but the PDF is an image and doesn't contain the text, or the PDF is formatted in a way which means I can't get the text out, then I can't do anything with it. Or it's much harder to do anything with it. And this is a real problem that we face across the whole publishing spectrum. Most of what we publish at the moment, PLOS included, is not very well set up for anyone to reuse it for any purpose whatsoever. It's really quite difficult. It's one of the reasons why text and data mining hasn't progressed as far as it should have, is because we don't make it easy enough. And again, I want to give you an example. This is a kind of, in a sense, a trivial example. On the top left, we've got a uh, phylogenetic tree, um, which is actually to be found in a Biomed Central paper. So, Paper is accessible, the licensing is Creative Commons attribution, so you can take this and, and process it and do what you want with it. And Peter Murray Rust and Ross Mounts have done exactly that and built software that turns that human readable thing into a machine readable form. Now you could argue they shouldn't have to do that at all because we should also publish the machine readable form alongside the human readable form. That would be useful, but we don't do that at the moment. So they've had to reverse engineer this. And in this case, they are able to reverse engineer it precisely because of the detailed format of the image. So the image in this case is a .svg. And what that means is that the file format says there's a line here and it goes to there. There's a letter here and a letter here and a letter here. And because the file format gives them that, they're able to process it to generate this machine readable data. Most file formats are what are called bitmaps. So they say, top left hand corner, color is black. Next one along, color white. So there's no sense of the objects within the image, which means you have to process the image first to try and pull the objects out of it. And because we tend to make things pretty with drop shadows and all these other kinds of things, it's basically impossible. So here's an example where by choosing to exp what file format you chose to save the image in, makes a difference to how well someone downstream can use it. And we have this all over the place. In, it's, not, it's in terms of data availability, in terms of pretty much everything we publish. We don't tend to think, how can I make this easier for someone to use? Last time any of you published a paper with a graph in it, did you add a CSV file that had the numbers? So we need standards, we need formats, we need exchange protocols, and this is hard work. This is really hard graph. And this is going to take up, once we've sorted out all the other stuff, which is easy by comparison, um, this is the next decade's worth of work. And it's not just that. All three of those also have to apply to machines, because it's the machines that are going to help us deal with all of this content. The notion that we can, as a human, deal with the content in our research domain, I don't care which research domain you're in, is these days, is frankly laughable. Um, and all three of them have to scale. And they have to scale to web scale, because otherwise we don't get the advantages and the benefits we're talking about. And all three of them have to support this notion of being able to reuse, both legally and technically, at scale. Cutting and pasting from the journal web page doesn't scale. You know those things you always do where you know that if someone could just build the tool for you, it would be so much easier because you're doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. There's things we do most of the time, most of most days. Um, 
that's what we've got to stop doing across the whole communications enterprise because we don't have the resources or the time to do it. And the other thing is we need to think about this in terms of enabling the unexpected. A lot of this is not about thinking, oh, that person could use my work. It's about the thought that someone somewhere could use my work and I don't know who they are or what they're going to do with it. But what I want to do is put in the appropriate effort to make it easy for that process to happen. As easy as I can with the resources I have and the time I have available to me. You can't do everything and that's, that's an important part of it. But I do want to argue that we've spent, we've spent 50 years arguing for curiosity driven research. Um, and we've done that on the basis that we can't pick winners, that we don't know where the research we need is, that we don't know what research is going to play out or what the impact of that is going to be. As the head of, as Chad Gaffield, who's the um, director of the Canadian Social Sciences Research Council said, on the 10th of September 2001, he was trying to justify a program of Islamic scholarship. The day after he wasn't. So we know that we can't predict what's going to happen. We know that we can't pick winners. We know we need to create a portfolio of research. Um, and those advances obviously are things we want. They, they should be happy um, and they will be unpredictable. We don't know where they're going to come from. But I would argue they should not be an accident because just as you can't predict the sum of two dice that I would throw, those of you who know some statistics would pick seven but you'd still be wrong more than half the time. But we know precisely what the distribution of multiple throws is mathematically. We know that from the design of the system. So if we throw the dice enough times, we know what we're going to get. And the point is when we construct our research systems, when we think about research communication, what we're doing is building those dice. And what the web allows us to do is to roll them more times than we ever have been able to before. We can reach the distribution, we can design for the outcomes without necessarily knowing exactly what they are. At this scale, you can actually manufacture serendipity. And that's the core of the opportunity. If we think about this at a different scale, then we can engineer the system so as to deliver better for our customers. And this is a question of building the right architectures. And those architectures need foundations and those architectures may very well be different in different research domains. And the foundations are well built in some disciplines and don't exist at all in others. So we shouldn't be trying to build a, sh a shaky stem house on no foundations in the humanities. We do need to lay the foundations to make this tractable and appropriate reliable. But at the same time what I would say in the, in the message of the title, or the subtitle, is this is not something that is going to happen in a few years time. This is something that has happened. We know what the shape of research communication for the next decade looks like in biomedical sciences. It looks like PLOS One and scientific reports and Bio One and Biology Open with probably a couple of top tier journals left at the top to keep the prestige mongers happy. That's what it's going to look like. We know in physics and particle physics that it's going to be the archive plus scope three. These things are in place. The train has left the platform. In social sciences and humanities, it's coming in, um, but it's not going to stay at the platform for very long in terms of the process of being able to influence the shape, the direction, the ultimate destination. And you don't have a lot of choice about the direction of travel. So coming to the end, I just want to re-emphasize those points. So there are three, three sort of key points. Um, the first is that we need access. That's what most of the current policy environment is seeking to deliver, is public access to research outputs. The second point is that if we want to create an environment in which these objects that currently exist can flow through. We do need the legal rights to enable people to do that. And that is, or at least feels like, a process of giving up control. Actually, it's giving up less control than we have traditionally, traditional publishers and copyright transfers. 
um, but that's a discussion we can have. And the third point is the real challenge for the future is this question of how do we actually make these things usable and reusable? And how do we do that with limited resources? Because that's not a trivial question. We have choices to make about whether we invest in data infrastructure or better publication infrastructure or formats or standards development. These are choices we're going to have to make. Um, so overall, the point I want to make is this. There's a huge potential, but we're not there yet by any means. Um, but also to always remember, we also have a stake in this. Um, we all want to live in a better world. Um, and we all believe, I think, that research can contribute to that. And all I'm really saying is that we need to understand and interrogate and build the systems to maximise the opportunity for research to contribute um, to that better world. In the end, we just want to see research used, whether that's in, in education or in further research, um, in the clinic, um, or in understanding who we are and where we've come from, um, understanding, our, understanding our cultural narrative. And we also want it used at the, at the right time. We understand that not all this research will have immediate applications, and the public actually understands in a very sophisticated way that research is a portfolio that has a range of different time frames, has a range of different efforts. Um, so we need to maximise the potential for discovery and reuse because then we probably don't need to wait the mythical 30 years for research, for some research at least, to reach its fruition. And for me, the easiest way to walk down that path um, is to set the default position to open access. Maybe not the 100% position, but the default position to a fully open access environment. Um, and I'd invite you to engage with that process um, because it's part of the future of what we're going to be doing. Um, as a researcher, when I was at the University of Southampton, I knew that basically all the problems in my life were the fault of two groups of people. One was the funders um, and one was obviously the publishers. Um, I then moved to work at a funder um, where I fully understood that the source of all my problems was the publishers or the researchers. And it won't have escaped your attention that I now work for a publisher. Um, so engaging with these issues um, is the way to influence them. Um, it's very easy for all of us to say, I have no control, I have no ability to change how things are working. But the, if you don't engage, um, then as I say, these things are done to you and complaining after the fact that something's been done to you um, is not the way to, to shape things so that we have a, a, the right future. And I'll stop there. I've got some questions to pose to you, but do you have any questions for me at this stage? Well, I think a round of applause first. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I've had a really thought-provoking, challenging uh, presentation. Um, it certainly challenged me in relation to um, thinking about impact, and what has any other people here been working on impact in relation to REF. Um, this is a, an opportunity for interactive, open access discussions. It's being filmed. It will be available to anyone who wants to see this. So I'm going to hand back to Cameron, who will, I think, first invite questions, and then we'll pose some questions. Um, it is a two-way exchange. Thank you. Yep. Hi, um, I'm a psychologist, and um, so I have published in PLOS One, but only because I've been able to sort of edge it in the health direction. I was interested in what you were saying about the social sciences open access training still being at the platform about to take off. Um, I wonder if you trains don't take off. <laughs> You know what? <laughs> uh, I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about where you see open access going, more specifically in social sciences. In the social sciences, so yes. Yeah, so, so the question is, I'm repeating the question for the for the recording, but the question is, where is open access going specifically in the social sciences? And I guess I would I would s separate things s somewhat differently. So I think the the key distinction is between um, what you might call the funded sciences and the rest. Um, so, you know, I said, I was quite careful when I chose my words when I said the future, the future of um, biomedical publishing. This is an area where there's funding, there's money in the system, and there's quite a lot of subscription money in the system that can be, that can be liberated. Um, and that's fine. So, so for those areas where, essentially where there is funding, 
And uh, to, to RCUK's credit, I think they, they, they signal this strongly, Wellcome Trust as well and others, um, when they say, you know, we're putting money in, um, maybe not enough, maybe needs to be, needs to be built up. Um, and that fits the system, the infrastructure, the foundations that we built in biomedical sciences. Um, in social sciences and, of course, in, in the humanities, not to speak of monographs, which is another whole difficult area, um, there's less money around. Um, there's less money in subscriptions that could ultimately be repurposed into some kinds of publication funds or whatever it might, we might work, and obviously there's less free cash um, that people have to pay for publication services. So I think where there are communities that are of a size that they can actively negotiate um, as a community around the translation of subscriptions into some form of publication fund or possibly endowments. I don't think anyone's looked closely enough at the potential for endowments for funding publication. Um, then I think there's, there are opportunities there. Um, that's probably more the case in the humanities than the sort of qualitative slash quantitative social sciences. Um, I think there's an opportunity to argue for given the government has said they wish to fund research communication as part of the effort of maximising impact, I think there's a case to be made, both for the humanities and social sciences, for a different funding settlement um, that acknowledges those costs. Um, and then the other thing to be aware of is per article costs in the social sciences and humanities. If you take the total number of articles um, and divide that by the total subscriptions for journals in humanities and social sciences, they're very high compared to those in the sciences. So there's actually quite a lot of efficiency gains to be found. And I think those efficiency, there's, there are efficiency gains that will hurt a little bit. So, you know, the nice paper and the, the glossy surface and, and the print, frankly. Um, though that's actually less of a saving than you might think. Um, there are opportunities to save quite a lot of money if those efficiencies, and one of the reasons why those efficiencies haven't been found in those domains is because the library community, bless their heart, are desperately trying to get subscriptions in STEM subjects down because that's where the money's being spent. Um, so uh, there's money in the system. Um, you need to make a play for that money earlier rather than later because otherwise it will just get sucked up by other domains and other disciplines. Um, and then the other opportunity is to think about the extent to which the community itself wants to run and support the journals in itself. So one of the other advantages the social sciences has is there a greater proportion of journals that are actually owned in a legal sense by the community. Um, so I would say we're not there yet in terms of the technical infrastructure to do this. Um, but within a couple of years, it will be possible for communities, if they decide to, to run very low cost journals um, and to not, and to, with, a, with an experience that feels close to what the best online can deliver today. Um, that's not free, <laughs> that's people committing time. Um, and I think I would, the other piece there is to think institutions should be thinking about what is the appropriate internal model for funding communication in, in social sciences or non-funded subjects in general. You know, there's a history in some disciplines of sharing that infrastructure across collaborations of institutions. Um, that's certainly a model. Um, there's certainly a lot of work um, with many libraries taking repository infrastructure and using that to serve as the underlying basis for a journal infrastructure. So UCL are doing some really interesting stuff with the UCL Press at the moment. Um, so there are lots of opportunities. Um, a lot of the detail depends on exactly what the financial state is, um, how strong the community is, how, if you like, concentrated, self-contained the community is, um, and how good your relationship is with the people who will probably be the ones with the money in their hands at the moment. Um, yeah, I've been reading some quite scary things about publication bias and how you know, the current system is basically totally geared towards just publishing positive results even when they might not actually be any really positive results. Do you think the 
rise in open access is likely to increase the sort of publication of negative results? Or is that something that's more so, so the question is, considering the issue of publication bias, specifically the publication bias towards positive results, will open access lead, will open access solve that problem? Um, I think at a theoretical level, the two questions are actually orthogonal. Um, so there's no direct relationship between open access and ease of publishing necessarily. In fact, some have argued that there's the inverse if you have a, an author side business model. Um, that could even act to discourage it, to discourage negative re results further. Um, what I think is that it's, we're not just talking about, we're talking about wholesale reform of the entire research communication system um, and research assessment system at the same time. Um, clearly those two things need to go hand in hand to be effective. Um, there's another whole talk I've got to give on research assessment where I focus on the question of assessing the degree to which things are reused as a measure of, um, so, um, which includes traditional citation measures but also you know, other kinds of measures. Um, so I think there's an opportunity with the flux we have at the moment to address some of those questions. To address those questions, we have to be honest with ourselves about what motivates us to publish. And I've got a desk load of negative results, um, including one that I wasted 50,000 pounds of government money on that other people knew wouldn't work but they hadn't published either. Um, and have I got around to publishing that? No. And it's not, that's driven in part just by a lack of time. Um, so we need to find ways of publishing things that, publishing those things that don't have the same kind of humps to jump over. Um, my suspicion is that one of the big humps and one thing we have to address in terms of this and in terms of data publication uh, is peer review and what we decide to peer review and what we decide not to peer review in the traditional sense. Um, because a lot of the problem with getting these negative results out is precisely the fact that am I going to spend three months battling with reviewers, particularly on negative results, to really show a negative result is really, really hard. You can't just show something didn't work that time you tried it. You have to show that it doesn't work and you have to understand why it doesn't work. Am I going to put that effort in? Probably not. Um, but if I can put out a little report that says, we tried this, it didn't work, and that pops up when someone asks the question, is this a good idea? Then, yeah, yeah it's not peer reviewed. You're not going to give it the same degree of um, credence. Um, and you might not even trust the degree of detail as much as you would. I mean, we can argue about how much detail there is in peer reviewed papers as well. That's a separate issue. Um, but to create an environment in which those things become available and can be discovered, I think we need to consider ways to make it easy to push them out. And we have to understand that when we make it easy to push them out, we're also increasing the opportunity for a lot of substandard information to come out. So how do you filter the stuff that you're looking for? But I'm a strong believer in the notion that um, we don't benefit anyone by not, bothering to, by not bothering to put things out. There's a lot of garbage on the web. But when you search for stuff, you can generally find what you're looking for. If we don't need to worry about the fact that there's another couple of terabytes of not entirely peer reviewed stuff on the web. What we need to worry about is marking up the stuff that reaches some sort of quality threshold. Um, that's a different, different problem that we can apply the same techniques that we've used for the last couple of hundred years to. We just need to think about applying them in a different way, possibly a more efficient way. Um, very interesting, thank you very much. Uh, there were two questions. One is, do you think that current electronic form of publishing, uh, even, uh, and particularly I'm thinking of uh, submission systems to standard journals, have decreased the quality of editorship? Um, I, I, what I see uh, increasingly is that editors take a hands-off rule now compared to when I started publishing, and I, I, I personally can see a decline in the quality of editorship. And how much would that worsen, would it worsen in open publishing? The second is, I, I very much uh, identified with the anonymous blog that you quoted of the policy uh, guy, because I find myself all the time doing, for example, very short notice journal editorials, maybe 24, 48 hour uh, notice. And I just, and I work in public health, so my uh, journal access needs are anything from, I don't know, law to engineering uh, 
to, to uh, basic science or apartheid or whatever. I, and I find it almost impossible to get past uh, paywalls. And I can't see who ever would be the funder for a very broad-based uh, policy intervention uh, stuff. Um, I get interviews of those two issues. Okay, so, so I'll tackle the first one first. So the, question, the question was, um, has there been a decrease in editorial engagement, I guess, yeah. in, the, in the editorial process, and, and would open access potentially exacerbate that? Um, and I thought it was interesting you picked particularly on submission systems. Um, submission systems are awful. The ones we have today are just utterly appealing. Um, and I, that's across the board. Uh, right. Open access, closed access publishers, they're just, they're just dismal. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity to create digital spaces where that kind of editorial curation could be a lot more enjoyable and a lot more engaging, um, and so we could do it better. Um, again, I would say, in principle, the question of editorial engagement and, and open access is, is orthogonal. Um, I think what open access raises, particularly open access funded through, let's say, an author side business model or a funder side push, push business model, is when you're paying for that publication service and where, frankly, in the end, you know, this is not a, PLOS is not a content business, by Net Central is not a content business or a service business. So once we get to a place where you're asking the question, do I go to this journal or that journal, then I hope we will get to a place where your experience of editorial engagement and, and quality um, is part of the, the weighing up of, of where you want to spend your money. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not always a, a market, <laughs> market driven neoliberal, but I think in, in, this, in this place, having that question in your mind, am I getting value for money, um, will help to create space where those services are offered um, and should be offered at a high level. And I think we can create the digital environments where they can happen more effectively and more readily than they have in the past. Um, and I think the opportunity as we think about this transformation that's occurring at the moment is to, is to focus, is to surface all of these issues. Um, I would say it's very different in, very, in different disciplines. Um, and I think it is potentially an interesting differentiator between what you might think of as a premium, premium product versus your, you know, your value for money thing. And you might choose different things for different pieces of research. Um, in terms of the question of who's funding, so the question was, who is the broad, is there, a, is there a, a funder who will step in and, and look after these high, these, um, I guess, interdisciplinary public policy spaces, which depend on so many different fields? Um, and that's a really good question. I think it's a question I don't have an easy answer to. Um, the, I think in part, part of the problem is that most of our funding is national and funded through disciplinary based research councils. Um, and un ultimately you're, what you're picking on is the architecture of the funding. Is our, is our current funding environment fit for purpose in terms of delivering those kinds of things? And I would, would you know, agree with the, with the notion that it's not, that there are small reforms that one could do and there are very large reforms that one could certainly point to as, as possibilities. And that, you know, I've, I've, my life has been spent at the, the, the black hole between physics, chemistry and biology. Um, you know, when you become a biophysicist when that's trendy and you become a chemist when that's trendy and you become a, uh, a molecular biologist when that's where the money is. Um, but that doesn't lead to creating a coherent program of research. So um, I think it's a problem. It's a problem that we can consider identify, uh, identifying. And I think it's at least promising that funders are starting to talk together collectively through things like Science Europe and the Global Research Council, whether you, you those bodies are to some extent talking shops, but at least when people are talking, they are talking and there's, there's an opportunity for, for that progress. But that's not going to be an easy problem to solve. Um, it, it either bottom up through, part of, part of the answer is if the underlying research from the different domains is all available and all reusable and all interoperable, then it becomes easy to recombine it. And that's part of the argument for consistent licensing and, and these kinds of things. Um, 
but that's a, um, but it is a big challenge. Right, we have about 15 minutes left, so I don't know whether perhaps you want to challenge us with a few questions. Yeah, well, so I wanted to, let, let me quickly show you just a couple of things. I thought I wanted to give you a sense of um, what an outsider might see looking in at you, actually, as an institution. Um, and I don't take these numbers seriously, but these are the numbers that any person could generate um, by looking at publicly available information. I've very specifically picked on publicly available information. Um, so what I did, and there's, there's, some, there's some messages in here. Um, so what I've done is I've gone to PubMed. Why have I gone to PubMed? Well, PubMed is a free source of bibliographic information. It is effectively the only source of free bibliographic information that also includes halfway decent affiliation information. So I typed in UE affiliation or University of the West of England. Um, I picked up a bit over 2,000 papers over all time. I suspect that's fairly large underestimate. Um, You've only got first authors now. Uh, so. It should have. It's a good question. Um, I'll check that. Um, but it's a figure anyway. Um, and I generally, my, my rule of thumb is generally take take those take those take those numbers and double them. Um, but as you say, if this is just first author, that would explain a lot of things actually. Um, I then did a search for journal articles which were peer reviewed, um, which were available full text in your institutional repository. And again, I haven't checked what that full text is. It may be a PDF of the abstract for all I know. Um, certainly that's the, that, ca that is the case in a number of uh, IRs around the country. Um, but um, yeah, using the web form that's, that's freely available on the front of your institutional repository, I, I just pulled a number, number from that. I pulled the number of papers that are in PubMed Central, so the, the, pub, the, the NIH repository. This would be the same number in Europe, PubMed Central. Um, so this should be capturing a lot of BBSRC, MRC, welcome-funded research. Um, and then I also looked using a tool that my group has actually built isn't, that isn't finished yet and again, so these numbers are lower bounds, not upper bounds. Um, how many of those papers had an RC UK compliant CC BY license on them? And the, the moral of the story is, um, it, if you take these numbers at face value, actually you've got a pretty, you're not doing too badly on the deposit into the institutional repository. Um, Again, those numbers are not di directly com comparable for two, th I mean, so overall time you wouldn't expect that to be terribly good because lots of older papers that presumably, it's rare for an institution to be beating people over the head around older papers. Um, but the 2012, 2013 figures um, actually look pretty good compared to, to what I picked up from PubMed. Um, and again, I might be missing a whole bunch of stuff. I will, I'm obviously missing a whole bunch of stuff because PubMed has a disciplinary bias. Um, I'm also um, potentially missing a whole bunch of stuff that's, that's collaborative. Um, but I think the, the point I wanted to make, which I thought was intriguing and, and unusual, I would say, um, in the UK now, um, is that there are actually four bars on each of those graphs. So in terms of, there's very little in PubMed Central which I was surprised by because a lot of those papers seem to be public health, nursing in particular, um, which I imagine could be funded by MRC, maybe are funded by the NIH, uh, not NIH, NHS, um, rather than MRC, and maybe a, a bunch of them are coming out of um, the hospital, I don't know. But I was surprised to see that, that, that comparable number so low. Um, the number of papers I could identify with a CC BY license on them was seven, um, of which five were in PLOS one. Um, and one was in PLOS neglected tropical diseases. Now that's partly because our tool isn't quite as good as some of the other journals. Some of the, again, I think again, public health journals, there may be some other things there. It's also partly because publishers don't provide the information. 
but, but the whole thing about CC by license is coming really to the fore. It's only been in the last couple of year, years. I mean, you know, the Welcome Trust, for example, it was the beginning of last year, I think, where they changed their requirement, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, middle of, middle of, middle of, well, so Welcome Trust changed it towards the end of 2012, and RCUK is, yeah. is, is April this year. So it's, um, it's, it's early days from now. Yeah, I mean, which is why I included the 2013 data, but the 20, 2013 looked worse than 2012. Um, I mean, <laughs> so 2013, I couldn't find any. Um, all of them, of the of those, a bunch, most of them were in 2012, which I thought was interesting in and, in and of itself. Um, but I was, um, so I was intrigued. I was intrigued by that. That was, and I guess say this is this is the kind of numbers that people be increasingly putting together. Um, they're not necessarily accurate. Um, they're not necessarily precise, um, but those are the kinds of things you can get from publicly available data. Um, so there's a, there was a question there for me um, around, and you know, if, if the focus here is on getting things into the institutional repository and that's working, then that's fine. Um, but I wondered whether that was a positive decision or, or what it reflected. I, I can't answer that question for you, but I thought it was interesting. Um, there seemed to be a strong bias to the IR and away from PubMed Central, and away potentially from OA Publishing. Um, I was going to pose a, a couple of different questions, but maybe I'll just skim through these and let you think about whether you know the answers to these, because um, that was really the, the point I was trying to make. Um, copyright is important. <laughs> um, understanding actually who owns it um, can be rather powerful. It turns out for pretty much every paper published from the UK, it's probably not legally clear who owns the copyright. Um, that's another one. Do you know the answer to this question? Um, yeah. Sorry? Research gate. So ResearchGate will tell you yeah, up until the point where else will issue a takedown notice. but. Um, <laughs> Um, but, but yes, yeah, so, so ResearchGate and things like that will, t will give you some sense, at least to the number of people looking at that place. Um, you might reasonably ask, what, what does that reflect in terms of people reading things at the journal website? Um, and I didn't dig enough, deeply enough into your IR to see whether people were, whether there was actual usage data available from that. There is. That's always good um, and very helpful. Um, this is always an interesting one. So you can probably immediately identify what the top journal in your field is. Why is it? <laughs> what, what, what makes it? Um, thank you. So that's the lead into this graph. <laughs> this is a graph of a um, person, guy called Bjorn Brems, um, who's a very successful neuroscientist uh, working in Germany. And it's a plot of the citation velocity for his papers, so the number of citations they've received per year versus the impact factor of the journal they're published in. And the one out there is a news and views piece. It's not actually a research article. So, and that drives that whole correlation. So the point I want to make is this is a classical statistical error. Um, Thinking that the characteristics of a combination of things tells you very much about the characteristics of the things in that collection is a classical statistical error, fundamental mathematical error. Um, using impact factors to, to, to decide, to, te to, to try and tell you what the quality of an individual article is, you may as well use a Ouija board. This is, I find this one really interesting as a former publisher because often publishers are blamed for this mis mismatch. And I, I have to say, I know everybody always blames somebody, another party, don't they? And I'm going to be no exception. Because I used to, I, I've, uh, used, I've plotted um, submission numbers against the variations in our journal impact factors for the period that that impact factor was in the public. Mm -hmm. you know, it was the latest one. wasn't even wasn't the period that it reflects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. The period, the period for, for which it was published, uh, there was a, a very, very, very strong correlation between submission numbers and the current impact factor. Yeah. And I'll tell you another thing. Uh, I, I, I'm not comfortable about this impact factor thing. And, the, and the, as a publisher, I mean, I, I put my hand up to do something guilty using the impact factor as a, as a as a promotional tool. We had to do it because authors demanded that we do it. We go to a conference. 
the first thing that people would say when you're when you're standing at a stand with a range of journals, what's the impact factor of this journal? So much so it was it was an all-time one. I used to do little stickers, mm. stick on the cover of the sample covers. This journal has an impact factor right. on because you had to because yeah. people people were asking. So it's actually driven by by you people actually that that. that it's a, it's a circular thing. I mean, this is, this is, the, this is, a, this is a problem um, that yeah. we drive it ourselves and then publishers reap the benefit and then we drive it ourselves. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But the ref doesn't use impact factors. I want to get promoted. I want to drive it, you know. The ref doesn't use impact factors. But we need to be at cases around impact. Impact's not the same as impact factor. I think, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's actually a really important point. And I think I, you know, Hefke have been absolutely clear that the journal in which an article is published shall not be used as, as, as a um, factor for judgment of um, the research quality of a submitted piece of work. Um, now, we all, we all use these rankings in our head as a proxy for taking the time to figure out what the impact of a piece of research is. Um, and we have to own up to that. Um, we all do it. Um, but I think the other thing, I'll, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just throw it in there, but the other, the other thing that's qu quite strongly retracted, uh, sorry, given away now, quite strongly correlated with impact factor is the um, number of papers retracted. And it's a positive correlation. So high impact factor journals have higher retraction rates than lower impact factor journals. I think, oh yeah, I was just going to, so this was a question I want to pose to you. You should have, you should be able to think about this, sorry. You should be able to think about this for yourself. I'm, I don't want to propose an answer to you, um, but hopefully as an institution, as a community, as departments, you can think about what, your be what benefit you're getting from these different mechanisms of making things available um, within the resource constraints you have. You know, let's, be, let's be honest about that. Um, we haven't talked much about cost except to do with, with social sciences, but I'm happy to hang around and if anyone wants to have that argument or that set of arguments, more than happy to do so. Um, I just wanted to finish with the kind of things you can do and I, you, I'll make these slides, give these slides to someone. Um, that's the one I want to emphasise. Um, none, of this, none of this happens without a collaboration between the researchers and the people having to deal with the frontline issue of negotiating with publishers over costs. So t talk to your librarians about what's happening when, th when things are getting cancelled, because things are going to get cancelled, because they do. Um, understand why that's happening, get involved in that process, um, and try to understand how you can use this as leverage to create the pools of money that will actually allow this to happen. Um, if you do that proactively and work in your communities, then you make a lot more progress than than otherwise. Yep. Could you just elaborate on real open access? Ah, oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> so, so there's two things. There's two things underlying there. One is there are lots of journals that call themselves open access um, but have very restrictive licenses. Um, in fact, in some cases, make it very difficult for anyone to actually access the work at all. They put it behind a login screen, those kinds of things. So, when I say open access and when PLOS says open access, we mean free to access on the web for no charge with no technical barriers under a CC BY license or better. That, that's what we mean. Then of course we get into the whole issue of um, this supposed, and I do think it's a supposed problem, of fly-by-night journals that are basically there trying to rip people off. Um, the bottom line for me to that is if as a scholar you're not making informed decisions about where you publish and informing yourself about the quality of the service you're getting, then I not sure we can blame other people for taking advantage of that. <laughs> um, that said, many of us are working very hard to try and provide certification validation mechanisms that will help you to make those kinds of decisions. Um, we understand it's an issue, um, particularly when these are new journals. Um, most open access journals are new journals. Um, new journals, it's hard to tell whether they're credible or not straight out of the, straight out of the gate. Um, but I, I will sort of defer to Mike Taylor's um, statement on this. You know, um, if someone comes from a journal you've never heard of and never read anything in of asking you to publish in it, don't. I'm going to stand up, so that's a very good point. <laughs> 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 um, 
Yeah, I, I think this is a very important message to all of us, isn't it? Um, I've also been vice president of a, 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 a learned society which relied on paper-based journals for its income. Um, so I think some of us can also work with our learning societies on that. I'm not going to say any more now because I know this was scheduled to finish at two. I've actually got another meeting starting now as well. Um, I think this discussion could have gone on and on actually. It's a really interesting, useful, thought-provoking topic. So I think we put our hands together and thank you again. Yeah.